Let's start right at the very beginning. Please tell us a bit about growing up and about your family. Well, um, well do I need the mic? It's right, yeah, for the okay. here, probably good idea. Um, well, um, I'm actually homegrown here. Uh, I, I grew up, I grew up in Toronto, although I did have an opportunity to travel abroad with my family when I was young. My dad worked in Britain for a couple of times over over the over the course of of his career, and uh, so I went along and kind of, you know, got absorbed into different school systems, you know, appropriately bullied, you know, things like that, sort of being the odd person out. I was always a bit different, I will say. I was fortunate in my family was not a highly gendered role, but pretty much this is, what you see now is kind of who I've always been. You know, I don't feel as though I made this transformation uh, into leather. I, I, you know, my sister tells this, used to tell the story very, very, uh, an interesting fact that she shared with me was she was really jealous of me when I was a little kid. She was like, oh, I've got this little sister. And, you know, she's like, and all these people are cooing and saying, oh, what a beautiful little baby. What a, what a you know, she's going to be a beautiful girl. And, and my sister was like, ah, they're, calling, they're calling Alex beautiful all the time. And then she said, and then the minute you were able to open your mouth, you said, I'm a boy. <laughs> and she was like, what the, you know, what the heck, you know, like, here's this girl that's getting all this praise for being beautiful, and not only that, but she's just rejected it. So, you know, I was lucky in the fact that, you know, my dad was an enlightened guy, and, you know, he, he wasn't terribly gender role, you know, he wanted to make sure I stayed safe, but he wasn't, he wasn't like so, so strict about gender roles, and these things are for girls, so I was happily allowed, you know, to have my little, my little Lego sets and my cars and trucks and, you know, play with stuff, you know, build, you know, like go out in the backyard, build forts, you know. <laughs> so I was, you know, I wasn't kind of shoved. I remember having like some wars with my mother though around, uh, you know, <laughs> getting dressed up and going to special events and, you know, things like that. There was always a little bit of a, uh, you have to wear a dress today. And I'm like, no. So, you know, there were some battles, but I was fortunate compared to you know, some people uh, who have grown up in much more gender uh, divided worlds. Uh, so, uh, But growing up, you struggled coming out, realizing that you had gender dysphoria. Please talk with us a little about that. I don't know that that's familiar to everyone. Yeah, you know, when you're, uh, I, I, I think it's actually, thank you for asking me that question because um, I think you know we. It's, there, there are a lot of a lot of uh, different agenda, gender identities out there, and I think we all, you know, need to come to accept that you know we all identify. We all may identify differently. Some of us are very clear. Some of us are very fluid. Some of us are somewhere in between the ends. Um, you know. When I was a kid, uh, growing up, I, I thought I could grow up and be my dad. You know, they said, you can be anything you want to be. And I'm like, okay, I want to be him. And so, you know, I did things. And he was, he was lovely that way. He, you know, I used to stand behind him when he was shaving in the morning in the mirror. He even bought me a little plastic razor that, you know, where the blades were removable. I would stand behind him shaving. You know, I would, like, watch him when he was doing his boots or his shoes. I mean, uh, I would, like, you know, push the little lawnmower with him. And, so, but then, you know, once you become a teenager, it, it's, you know, all of a sudden your world changes. I was playing hockey with the boys, I was, you know, out in the parks, I was, and then all of a sudden I was expected to conform. And I, I didn't, you know, I didn't have any role models then. I, I'd never met a queer person, I'd never met a gay person, I had never met a transgendered person. We had tomboys, and I think, you know, there were, there were, you know, there were lesbians and there were homosexuals and it was, you know, like it was a bad thing to be called a lesbian at school and a bad thing to be called a homo at school and, um, you know, and I was, I didn't know what I was. I knew that I didn't want to, you know, I wasn't like happily growing into the adult woman that I always wanted to be and so I, I struggled and it wasn't until, you know, I, I ran into you know, the, I, had, I, had some, I had some years when I wasn't happy and uh, I wasn't coping well. Uh, and, 
you know, I think finding the communities, the queer community and ultimately the leather community and being able to come out into who I was authentically is, is what, what really made the difference and allowed me to start to live a, you know, a happy um, and whole life and existence. Well, what kind of struggles did you have? Do, do you see people even today struggling with similar topics? I think, uh, yeah, I think today, I mean, I think there's a lot more ways for people to figure them, maybe, I mean, it's hard to figure yourself out, but, you know, when I was coming of age, or whatever that means, um, there wasn't the online resources that there are, you know, we didn't even have computers at that point. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I did get a computer during my coming out process and, and things, and, but back then it was bulletin board chats. I think now people can more, more see all the variety that there is and say, hey, I'm that. But, you know, I think people still struggle because we need help. We need help, um, you know, we need to be validated and yeah. acknowledged and accepted. And so I think where people still struggle is finding where they belong, being welcomed, being set, you know, having whatever, whatever formula they have in their head about who they are validated and yeah. And yeah. accept it, and I think that's an appropriate, uh, or that's a that's a struggle that that will always happen. And you know, but I also think that um, we, have, you know, as a community, um, in in our community, we have a role to play in that. Well, tell us a bit about your identification as a boy, and and what drew you to that. You know, it's funny because uh, part of me can say. I was always this boy, right? Um, I was always, I was always a boy. I was always looking for a daddy that kind of said, "Come here, boy," you know, or um, or a mentor, or a top, or a, it didn't have to be, a, it didn't have to be a male role, just somebody in charge, you know, to kind of say, "You're doing good, reassure, you know, you that you're on the right path and stuff." You know, I just, I just, I need to feel as though I'm pleasing people. <laughs> it's just, it's just one of my things. I like to make people happy. I like to know I'm doing a good job. Um, when I, when I came into the leather community, and um, you know, I, I, I'll tell you a story about that, about coming in and how, <laughs> how I found the door, but uh, you know, I, I got exposed to all these people, like here are these real people living this kinky lifestyle that I always wanted. You know, I thought I was a big old pervert when I was like, you know, when I was growing up and I was telling my friends, I'm like, have you ever like tied each other up? And you know, like, I, like <laughs> as a little kid, and they're all going, yeah. You know, a couple let me do it to them, but nobody would like, you know, I'd say, well, let me show you. If it, and, <laughs> and then, but then they didn't want to turn around and do it to me, which is what I really was looking for. It's like, I'll show you how to do it. Now, come on, do it to me. So, um, but it didn't work out that way. But then once I found this community and, you know, people were letting, willing to let me hang around, I got introduced to this, this leather boy. Like, it's like, I, I met somebody who identified as a leather boy, and I'm like, that's it. That's what I am. And I, um, they, they even had a boys training camp in Texas, and it was like, sign me up. Two, two, two friends of mine that I knew went, went one year. Wow. And uh, I signed up the next year, and uh, I went down, and I met like all these, this, these faculty that were like my fantasy of, of what a, what, what, you know, men and women, of what, what, a, what the ideal top was for me, and all these boys, and we were all dressed the same, and we all had to say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. You know, we had to, we had to, like, learn how to be, how to be, how to be good, you know, how to anticipate somebody else's needs. We learned how to define ourselves and, and say, what am I? What is a leather boy? And, and, you know, and how do we, how do we belong in our community? And how do we, how do we stand out and, and be acknowledged, and how do we protect ourselves and keep ourselves safe, and and develop this this you know this kind of boys club? It was kind of like it was kind of like the grown up kinky version of Boy Scouts, and it was just perfect for me. <laughs> how long of of a seminar was this? Well, it was it was four days, but it was pretty it was pretty intense because we arrived you know in the evening we spent like. 14 hours a day in this kind of dungeon, in, you know, wow. space, and okay. you know, we ate there. We all had to, we all had to dress the same, and we we had this really intense sharing with 
people, you know, people coming in. We had we had uh, Vi Johnson come in, and, okay. and it was a small group. It was like twenty of us. And Vi Johnson was sharing, you know, here's here's my journey. She was sharing about about her journey, and and we were all listening. And she was like, you know, if I could do it differently, I would have done this. And here's what I want to pass on to you. And there was some serious sharing going on. And um, wow. it was like a spiritual experience. So even though it was only four days, we started a little Yahoo group after, and we, we kept each other, you know, like there were some boys that, that you know, didn't have a community place to belong. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, they either didn't have their own, their own sirs, their own mams, or their own mistresses, masters at home. And, and so we kind of set up a little community. They didn't have Fantastic. other boys at home. And so they could stay in touch with, with us and, and at least live out, you know, some degree of their authenticity, um, you know, with, with us as support. We, we kind of supported each other through difficult times, through, cool. um, you know, coming and comings and goings of relationships. And we stayed together, you know, online for about five years. It was, wow. it was a remarkable uh, connection. Well, what challenges have you had as a boy? Did anything really manifest during this four-day seminar? Um, well, the challenges, yeah, the challenges that manifested during a four-day seminar was, um, you know, I was learning a lot about, you know, how, how like, we were learning how to be in a, a particular kind of boy. I mean, some boys went on to just to be sort of, community service members and yeah. we're happy to play that role in their community. I was more, you know, I'm, I play with DS dynamics. I don't play with them, I live them, right? So, dom and for those of you who don't know what that is, it's dominant, dominance and submission. And so, when I'm in a relationship, it's a power-based relationship and it's, an ex it, you know, I give up a degree of, I did give up my power and somebody else takes it on and we live, we live that way. At the time, I was just learning about how to do that, and I was making loads of mistakes. And so, as I was learning during the camp from people who were living this way and have been for years, a lot of things that I, you know, that I hadn't learned yet were coming up. And it, you know, oh, wow. like learning is a learning is a hard thing to do. You know, sometimes it, it involves analyzing yourself, and and sometimes finding yourself falling short, and sometimes finding out what what you need to do to improve. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and it can create a feeling of loneliness. Um, the other, the, the rest of the challenges of being a boy haven't come so much from that. It's sort of, you know, being, being, I think for boys, sometimes I think it's being taken seriously in their community uh, that's, uh, you know, a, as actual, you know, as actual leadership material, you know? Like, yeah. thank you. Um, uh, you know, sometimes we, we see, you know, everybody looks to the, to the big top, you know, kind of dominant energy, you know, master, you know, not, not to say there's anything wrong with that. That works, <laughs> that works for me too. I know it's those people too. Um, uh, and, but it's also acknowledging that, you know, the, the sort of, the, the boys that are waiting for direction, the boys that are saying, what can I do to be of use? And, and you know, running off and doing that, and, and spending their time are, are also uh, a, a, f a force. They're, they 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 need to be, you know, considered to be uh, part part of our leadership as well. So I think that's just just getting taken seriously, and that could just be my own my own feelings. But, um, but I've heard valid. other boys boys say that. You know, like I think bo some boys have said, "Well, I had a hard time." You know. Be getting a title in my community, and because people kind of said, "Well, how can you lead if you're always needing direction?" and it's like, "Well, we figure it out," you know. Um, yeah. yeah, and and yeah. so I think I'm always I'm always celebrating when I see a boy, a girl, a submissive, a puppy. Um, if they're you know, and all puppies are are on the on the bottom side of the equation. I know that, but. Um, uh, you know, win uh, and and take on roles. I think it's it's a uh, it's exciting when I see that. Well, you've said that self expression very much matters to you. How so? Um, well, I was. What I mean by self expression is 
my my ability to 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 be who I am without shame, um, and that's not that's not always easy, you know. Like, you know, being being non-normative, you know, like we don't fit in everywhere, you know. I don't I don't know if anybody else here can re can relate to that, but uh, you know, sometimes people kind of go, oh, you know, you're just a little bit different, and and differences uh, uh, sometimes make people in the wider, wider world afraid. Um, differences are, are fear-provoking things. And uh, I think self-expression was something that was really valuable. Coming in to, you know, and, and it was the first place that I was ever accepted, just living out loud who I am, you know? I came in, I, I was this kind of boyish-looking female-bodied person that came into, uh, at the time, there were leather dykes and there were there were leather men, but it was it was a lot more leather men, you know, in the in in this community, uh, you know, the, the the Mr. Leatherman Toronto, currently heart of the flag, and it was like, you know, come on in, we'll find a place for you, and being accepted, uh, self-expression is where else in the world can you can you live as the puppy you've always felt yeah. you are, can yeah. you be the the daddy, the, the, the mommy, the, the, the master that, that you've always felt you are. Um, be the boy, be the girl, you know, like, and, and live that. Um, and we may not understand all of each other's um, proclivities or, or, you know, preferences and, and your, how you choose to live your life may not always make sense to, to me, but if you're not, if it's not abusing me or, or violating me in yeah. any way, I really think it's I really think it's important that we're all able to express ourselves and and, and live live out who we are. And, and this is a perfect community, and that's what for that one it's not perfect. But yeah. I mean, <laughs> this is this is an ideal um, <laughs> world for that to happen in. Well, in in building on that a little bit, what does mentoring? mean to you and how were you mentored you know yeah ment mentorship wow that's a huge topic um and it's it's really key to who we are as as a community um uh, i mean you can't get everything online you know that's where you know i mean i think that the young, you know, the, the younger leather people coming in or, or, or kinky people or gear people or however people are defining when they find their way into our community, they can meet each other, they can find all their, their you know, what they need and, and you know, gear and uh, practices and safety tips and things online, but yeah. mentorship is something more. Mentorship is, um, it's how the generations connect. Um, how we can all, you know, share uh, our our community. So when you're when you're new, and it's not always age. Some people find their way into the community later, yeah. and still are in need of mentorship. Um, me mentoring can be formal. Um, uh, you know, there's roles that are built into our community that are mentor type roles. Title holders. Title holders are sometimes the first po portal that somebody sees into a world. That's how I find my way in. Found my way in. I was standing watching the Pride Parade and I saw, I saw some hot leather dykes on a float and I was like, oh my god, they're organized. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and they, were, they were up there with the men and somebody was getting their back whipped and I, I basically stalked them. <laughs> After, <laughs> after the parade, I hate to admit that, but Why not? not enough. Tell, tell them. Tell <laughs> I, them. I, I was like, you know, how do I meet these people? So I just kind of followed them around and watched <laughs> them in bars. I said, what bars do they go to? And what clubs and what events? And finally I got up enough nerve to talk to one of them. And, you know, <laughs> but that's, that, that's one form of mentorship. You, you know, title holders are, are, are there as the first welcome and come on in and let me introduce you to people. Mentors are people who set up boot blacks. I've been men I'm a boot black. I've been mentored uh, amazingly as a boot black. Here, uh, you know, we've got blacks who mentored so many boot blacks here, and our 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 community, our Toronto boot black community is 
is one of the best examples of mentorship. In, yeah. in, there we in go. America, I gotta say and um, you know, um, it's you know, here are the skills you need. You know, not to not to wreck somebody's five hundred dollar leather boots. Here yeah. are the um, you know, here is how you handle it. If you're boot blacking in a in a bar and somebody starts opening their fly and pulling their you know jock strap you know jock strap aside and you're like uh oh well um, that's not part of my service <laughs> and, and you know like mentors can tell you how to handle situations like that right and so uh, you know it's it's and then mentors are you know there's there's these community groups all over that yeah. that provide mentoring or it can just be one on one it can be you know what hey you look new. Um, let me teach you how to survive in here. Um, we pass yeah. along the values of our community through mentorship, you know, Absolutely. and what's important. Um, it's not just a, you know, it's not just a quick way to get off. We're here, we're, we're living here. We're living our lives out here. And I think mentorship is a key part of that. It's our family. It's how we build, it's how we build love and family into 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 our connections here. You, you brought up boot blacking. Tell us a little bit about that because that's very that's a very important piece of who you are and what you do. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Boot blacking is a, is a huge part of what I what I do. Um, I always. I don't know what I like. I, well, there's there's my serious answer and there's my sexy answer. My sexy tell answer both, is <laughs> my both. sexy answer is what better way way to meet hot sexy people wearing 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 boots than on your knees in the back of a dark bar. <laughs> That's my sexy answer. Um, and and it, it's true because I was a bit of a shy boy. Um, when people say, how did you get into, what, what drew you to boot blacking? I mean, well, the first one is, well, boots, right? <laughs> boots drew me to boot blacking. I love boots. I think they're just amazing. Um, the other thing was watching, you know? I remember seeing black and, you know, and, and uh, what were they, the marine shorts or, or the marine boxers he used to wear. And I watched, mm -hmm. I watched him doing, doing people's boots and the textures and the smells and the, the connection that I saw happening. Um, not to mention the, the opportunity to care for some of the hottest boots I've ever seen. Um, that drew me in. Um, it was also a good way for me to feel useful. Um, because as I said, I'm a boy, I like to feel useful. Um, I'm a leather boy, that is. And uh, that's how I identify. Uh, that's, uh, that's what I need to make me tick, is to feel useful. Um, to, feel, to feel that I'm being of service. Um, and. You know whether I had whatever whether I had a, a relationship going on a surface based relationship at that time or not, boot blacking was always a good way for me to 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 find that and, and to raise money for really important causes. You know it's really you know I mean leathermen tip well when you're when yeah. you're when you're raising money for a good cause. You know we yeah. saw that last night with the auction how we all came together and. It, when it, in a good cause, you know, a boot, boot blacking is a great way to, to do that. And, um, you know, it's another th I was talking again last night with somebody about the unique, you know, unique experience of connecting to somebody through the act of doing their boots. Um, boot blacking is, uh, is like a gen is it, uh, an activity where gender doesn't matter so much. A lot of people kind of go, really? Uh, I don't know. And I've met some of those people at, during my title year out of Boot Black Toronto 2006. Um, I was boot blacking after a Mr. Leatherman Toronto event and uh, at the Black Eagle, and there were a couple of British guys who sat in my chair, and they said, this is funny, he said. We've never had a, you know, they, you know, during the conversation, they realized that I was, I was a, a female-bodied, masculine-presenting person. And they said, I've never had a, a female touching my boots. And so I got a little chance to, to explain to them, you know, a little bit about my gender. And, I, and then I, I got a chance to say, you know what, try, I'm not having sex with you here. I can have a really sensual experience with you here. I said, try and suspend. I said, like, just try and suspend your, your, uh, your focus on gender. And try to imagine me as whatever, whatever kind.
kind of energy you want to be black in your boots. And wow. I gave, and, and wow. he did, and, I, and then I went into him and we started to talk about where did you get these boots? How long have you had them? Why did you pick these boots? And then wow. we talked about where have you worn them? <coughs> what experiences have you had in them? And, you know, and I was explaining what products I was putting on them and I was showing him how, how you could put it on with love and, and care. And, and I think I was with him for like an hour and we just kept, wow. kept going, you know? Like, and um, so, and even if it hadn't, and we got some sensuality going on and he just, and it, even if it hadn't, he got up from that chair and he can walk away and say, you know what? I feel so my leather has been loved. And Absolutely. you know, leather in our community has a lot of history. It gets passed down, uh, people have a story. To be the guardian of that, to get a chance to help people care for their leather and, and help them look good in it is, is a real privilege. Absolutely. And, uh, and a, real, a real thing that, a real bond you can share with somebody, whether it's purely technical, where you're, where you're explaining every little thing movement you're doing, or whether you're licking their boots and using yourself as furniture. You know, <laughs> it's all a way to connect. What's been your greatest service accomplishment? Oh, um, I don't know. That's hard to say because service, I've done different things, you know, service, service to me is, uh, service is how we express love in our community, you know. I, for me, like, service is how I express love. Um, I've been, I've been a title holder and I felt really proud of you know just being there for my community at the end of the year you know helping out as part of the team um you know learning the lessons that that i learned you know with i wasn't always comfortable on a mic and you know the first the first the first time i had a title i i i had this big muscle guy who was mr black eagle as my thing and as my partner i'm like this is your sash husband and I'm, like, I'm like, oh my God. Uh, and, uh, and he said, be here on Saturday. I'm hosting an event. And then he shoved the mic into my hand and said, get up there. And it was like, the bar was full of guys. Like, I, there was not one face I knew there. And I got up there and did that. And so, you know, like being proud of your accomplishments and learning how to connect and, and, and that. But service, my, I wouldn't call that my greatest accomplishment. It was my greatest challenge. Okay. Um, but, you know, also being invisible. Be, being invisible as somebody in the back, the backup, you know, like being a gopher at an event, you know, where, where when everything, anything falls apart, you're, you're responsible to make sure the flip chart gets to that room and the, the evaluations get handed in and, oh my God, there's no power on the third floor and it's your job, you're, yeah. you know, you, a, and, that is a huge, huge accomplishment, and it's not, it's invisible. Right. And, and, yeah. and that's, you know, like, but I know that when I'm in that role, it's, it's love, right? And that's an accomplishment. And then there's, you know, being in service to, you know, uh, my, my ma'am or my sir, um, I've had both. Um, uh, and currently do, <laughs> and uh, that's great. And and you know just just being somebody that they trust and rely on, and and finding my way to say I love you through performing services for them, for anticipating their needs, for putting their needs ahead of mine sometimes, or often, you know, as often as I can manage. <laughs> That's pretty heavy. I don't even know where to go with the next question after that. But I do want to ask you about being one of the founders of the Toronto Boys of Leather. Please tell us a little bit about that. I, uh, and, and it, it's true because I was a bit of a shy boy. Um, when people say, how did you get into, what, what drew you to boot blocking? I mean, well, the first one is, well, boots, right? <laughs> boots drew me to boot blacking. I love boots. I think they're just amazing. Um, the other thing was watching, you know? I remember seeing black and, you know, and, and uh, 
Well, what were they? The marine shorts or, or the marine boxers he used to wear. And I watched, mm -hmm. I watched him doing doing people's boots and the textures and the smells and the, the connection that I saw happening. Um, not to mention the the opportunity to care for some of the hottest boots I've ever seen. Um, that drew me in. Um, it was also a good way for me to feel useful um, because, as I said, I'm a boy. I like to feel useful. Um, I'm a leather boy. That is and. Uh, that's how I identify. Uh, that's how, that's what I need to make me tick is to feel useful, um, to feel to feel that I'm being of service. Um, and you know whether I had whether whether I had a, a relationship going on a surface based relationship at that time or not, boot blacking was always a good way for me to 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 find that and and to raise money for really important causes. You know it's really you know I mean. Leathermen tip well when you're when you're yeah. when you're raising money for a good cause. You know we yeah. saw that last night with the auction, how we all came together and it, when it, in a good cause. You know, a boot, boot blacking is a great way to to do that. And um, you know, it's another. Th I was talking again last night with somebody about the unique you know, unique experience of connecting to somebody through the act of doing their boots. Um, Boot blacking is uh, is like a gen is a, uh, an activity where gender doesn't matter so much. A lot of people kind of go, really? Uh, I don't know. And I've met some of those people at during my title year at the Boot Black Toronto 2006. Um, I was boot blacking after a Mr. Leatherman Toronto event, and uh, at the Black Eagle, and there were a couple of British guys who sat in my chair, and they said. This is funny," he said. "We've never had a, you know, they, you know, during the conversation, they realized that I was, I was a, a female-bodied, masculine presenting person, and they said I've never had a, a female touching my boots, and so I got a little chance to to explain to them, you know, a little bit about my gender, and I, and then I, I got a chance to say, you know what? Try. I'm not having sex with you here. I can have a really sensual experience with you here. I said. Try and suspend. I said, like, just try and suspend your, your, uh, your focus on gender, and try to imagine me as whatever, whatever kind of energy you want to be blacking your boots. And wow. I gave, and, and wow. he did, and I, and then I went into him, and we started to talk about where did you get these boots? How long have you had them? Why did you pick these boots? And then wow. we talked about where have you worn them? <laughs> what experiences have you had in them? And you know, and I was explaining what products I was putting on them, and I was showing them how how you could put it on with love and and care. And and I think I was with him for like an hour, and we just kept wow. kept going, you know, like and um, so and even if it hadn't, and we got some sensuality going on, and he just and. It, it, even if it hadn't, he got up from that chair and he can walk away and say, you know what, I feel so my leather has been loved. And, Absolutely. you know, leather in our community has a lot of history. It gets passed down. Uh, people have a story. To be the guardian of that, to get a chance to help people care for their leather and, and help them look good in it is, is a real privilege. Absolutely. And, uh, and a, real, a real thing that a real bond you can share with somebody, whether it's purely technical, where you're, where you're explaining every little thing, movement you're doing, or whether you're licking their boots and using yourself as furniture. You know, <laughs> it's all a way to connect. Well, what's been your greatest service accomplishment? Oh, um, I don't know. That's hard to say, because service, I've done different things, you know, service, Service to me is, uh, service is how we express love in our community. You know, I, for me, like, service is how I express love. Um, I've, been a, I've been a title holder, and I felt really proud of, you know, just being there for my community at the end of the year, you know, helping out as part of the team, um, you know, learning the lessons that, that I learned, you know, with, I wasn't always comfortable on a mic, and, you know, the first, the first, the first time I had a title, I, I, I had this big muscle guy who was Mr. Black Eagle as my thing and as my partner. I'm like, this is your sash husband. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, oh my god. Uh, and, and he said, 
be here on Saturday. I'm hosting an event. And then he shoved the mic into my hand and said, get up there. And it was like the bar was full of guys. Like, I, there was not one face I knew there. And I got up there and did that. And so, you know, like being proud of your accomplishments and learning how to connect and, and, and that. But service, my, I wouldn't call that my greatest accomplishment. It was my greatest challenge. Okay. Um, but, you know, also being invisible. Be, being invisible as somebody in the back, the backup, you know, like being a gopher at an event, you know, where, where when everything, anything falls apart, you're, you're responsible to make sure the flip chart gets to that room and the, the evaluations get handed in and, oh my God, there's no power on the third floor and it's your job, you're, yeah. you know, you, a, and that is a huge, huge accomplishment and it's not, it's invisible. Right. And, and, yeah. and that's, you know, like, but I know that when I'm in that role, it's it's love, right? And that's an accomplishment. And then there's, you know, being in service to, you know, uh, my my ma'am or my sir. Um, I've had both, um, uh, and currently do. <laughs> and uh, that's great. And and you know, just just being somebody that they trust and rely on, and and finding my way to say I love you through performing services for them, for anticipating their needs, for putting their needs ahead of mine sometimes, or often, you know, as often as I can manage. <laughs> That's pretty heavy. I don't even know where to go with the next question after that. But I do want to ask you about being one of the founders of the Toronto Boys of Leather. Please tell us a little bit about that. I, uh, the Toronto Boys of Leather, um, unfortunately it's not going right now. Um, I'll kind of go into that a little bit, but when I first discovered the boy identity and I went to boys training camps and, and I just got electrified, you know, by all the events going on here uh, in the States, I traveled, I traveled to a lot of events in the States where they had a really, really solid boy community built up already. And I, I met other cities where they had had the, the boys of leather and they had their own flag and it was like, oh wow, you know, it was like that whole kind of Boy Scouts thing that I liked. And, and um, you know, and the girls of leather also came, came, came up, um, up during that time as well, which was lovely. We, we didn't, uh, we called ourselves the Toronto Boys of Leather and then opened our, our group up to anybody who identified as a boy or a girl or a puppy or, uh, we tried that. I mean, it's hard to be inclusive and, you know, we, it's always a challenge to, to hammer through all the, all the language and all the rules that make us, make our communities inclusive and, um, and, and also in line with identities. Um, I, n I don't think we did that perfectly. Um, I, I'm actually, I know we didn't. Um, however, what we did do is we, um, I saw these clubs in the States um, having places for, for boys to, to come together that may not have daddies, that wanted to be of service to each other, that or, or to their community, that wanted to teach each other stuff. And, um, and so we got, we we took on a membership. There were some girls, there were some boys, there were a couple of puppies, there were some switchy people. And we, we, we had, you know, workshops, little workshops for each other. We, we tried to go out and do fun things together. We, we volunteered when, when the leather community was having an event. We, we, we found ways to be of service. And um, wow. we, had, we had our own identity, we had a patch, we had a, a t-shirt. It was, it was a good time. We kind of, people moved on from it. And it's, as I said, there's a lot of work to be done in expanding your criteria to be more inclusive and, and inclusive to, of, um, of different identities so that people feel welcome. So I think, uh, I think around that time that we were trying to do that, we just did, we just kind of lost the energy. People were getting tired, they were getting more jobs, they kind of, I, I'd always be happy if anybody wanted to revive that and, you know, and, and talk, to, talk to those of us who were there at the time. We can, we can uh, you know, sort of share some of our experiences and 
how how you know the pitfalls and the, and the, the gifts of that. But it was a, it mm -hmm. was a fun time. I got to say. If you could go back in time and revisit any part of your leather journey and change anything, what would you choose to change and why? Uh, that's a hard question to answer. Um, well, I'll tell you, I would have found it a lot sooner. <laughs> <laughs> if I could change, I would have. I would have come in here. You know, if this, if I'd have found, if I'd have found you guys when I was a teenager, I, I, well, maybe I would have had to wait till I was legal. Um, <laughs> uh, if I'd have found the community, then that, I would change that. I would change getting involved earlier. I don't think, I don't think that I would change a lot though. Even my harder experiences, I, you know, when I was. You know, I, I've learned a lot through error and through, you know, bad emotional reactions, whatever, all kinds of stuff I've learned. Um, I, I have some regrets, um, but I don't For think example. I'd change it. You know, just, just being, I don't know, being sort of, you know, learning to be, um, learning to not be so, I don't know, say defensive, or learning yeah. not to okay. take take feedback so personally, or you know things like that. That's a very personal thing that I would change. Um, I would I would learn to to recognize the gifts that people are giving me when they're giving me feedback. Um, let's see what else. So I wasn't going to say that. Um, <laughs> let me see now. Um, Another thing is, is that I would remember that this community isn't, you know, I think when I was struggling, like I had some personal times in my life when I was losing stuff big time, you know, like, you know, deaths and changes and stuff like that. And, mm -hmm. you know, at that time I thought, you know, the community is a place where everybody wants to have fun. We're all about, hey, nice to see you. Let's get sexy together. Let's get, you know what I mean? Like, I know I'm being really glib about that. It's not how it really is. but. You know, sometimes you feel when you show up at our events that you have to be on, you have to be happy. And you know what, this, this is, our lives are happening and we're living and we're each other's, we're each other's, this isn't some kind of alternative reality. This is reality. And yeah. I think what I would do differently is when I was struggling and feeling as though I were, uh, as though I wasn't fun enough to show up, I think I, I may have isolated myself a little bit and I think mm. What I would do differently in that time is reach out, be me, you know, trust, trust the love that I know that is in this community to, yeah. to, to connect with and, you know, and keep, keep me going through, through the struggle. So, you know, we, we, we stand, we work together. We, we, we see, we're not just here for the good times, we're here for the bad times too. And, you know, our community has faced things like the, the AIDS epidemic. You know, our community, you know, I wasn't around, I wasn't part of the leather community that for, at that time, but I've heard how, how, how hard it was and how much pain there was and how, e how tempting it must have been to just check out, but you know, but nobody was there. We're there for each other. I, I need to, to remember the spirits of the people who, who went through those times. And, and, and when I'm going through my own hard time or when we're looking at queer people we're, we're talking about Rainbow Railroad. We need to stand together and, and recognize that we're, we're as misfit, as outsiders as we are here, we're very privileged. And just to stand together and, and, be, and be the force that we are to connect and, 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 and defend and protect and heal each other. Wow, absolutely. So I'll, I'll finish with one final question, and that is, what's the biggest misconception about you? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'd have to know what people are conceiving about me. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> anybody conceiving anything right now? <laughs> I don't know. I think. Uh, I think. Um, 
I don't know. I, I, that, oh, there we go. Thank you. I don't know. I think it was just, I had to, I, I don't think, it, I think my misconceptions about me probably came from me, not from That's anybody fair. else. You know, I was, I was thinking, you know, uh, my friend Nancy was, uh, you know, she laughs about the time when I used to go to the leather dyke parties and the leather women parties or queer parties or all the parties that she had. And I used to think that my only role was to get up and do dishes and, and, and serve and that I wasn't useful in the community. I wasn't part of the community unless I was, I was doing something like boyish for somebody. And, that, and she, she put, put me in there and she stuck me in, the, in a table and wouldn't let me get up for the rest of the evening. And I felt so useless and I was like, everybody's gonna think I'm like, like you know, um, I'm not, you, I'm not worth anything or, you know, they're not gonna like me because I'm not doing anything. And, you know, she just made me sit there and then, I, and it didn't change how anybody treated me. So the cool. misconception was mine, you know, that, you know, we That's all, cool. we belong whether we're, whether we're, you know, we're not, we're not capital. We're, 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 we're people, we're valuable. We're, we're not a set of skills and services. We're, we're, whole people that are loving beings deserving of, of the connections that we have. That, so I know that's not really answering your question. No, it does, it does. Yeah. Misconceptions are whatever you want them to be. Thanks, are we done? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, boy Alex. Yeah,